There's like shapes and alphanumeric letters like keyhole and square and whatever the heck a splintered A is. Maybe we should talk a little bit about forge markings and what they are. Welcome back everybody, Clint here today with Classic Firearms, coming at y'all with a video, well, that our intro might suggest, is all about those little markings that you see on your upper receiver just behind the brass deflector, well, for some. But anyway, those markings, to a lot of people, mean everything. But at the end of the day, you can comment down below your favorite forge, uh, but at the end of the day, it really comes down to the machining, which is what brings you the quality of your firearm. I think at least. Anyway, you can disagree with me down in the comments section, which I know you will, so it's fine. But let's go ahead and talk about a little bit what those forge markings mean. And let's start off with the keyhole guide. The little keyhole that you see re represents Ciro Fabricated or Fabrications. They've been around since 1915, utilizing large diameter, or I should say producing large diameter brass rods. And you can comment down below what you think that might be used for or how your great grandmother used it. But uh, anyway, Continuing on, they've been around since I said 1915, and they actually started manufacturing all sorts of different, well, I can't say manufacturing, forging all sorts of different parts for firearms, including the upper receiver, lower receiver, charging handles, even doing some optics tubes, which I think is pretty cool. And what you can tell too is when you look at a stripped upper receiver versus an upper receiver blank versus a <laughs> completely our complete upper receiver you'll notice you kind of see like the birth of this upper receiver you'll go from something that doesn't have the any machining done whatsoever you're just simply looking at a forged blank it doesn't have any of the cuts for the picatinny uh, if it's going for a flat top it doesn't have any holes or sometimes it might have a thread but it's not threaded back here you know where the stock meets or anything like that it's just all one solid piece of metal. Then it gets to the actual machinist or the manufacturer, and they're the ones that do all the cutting and drilling and everything else and the threading for whatever it might be, right? So at the end of the day, a lot of manufacturers could be utilizing the same forge for their materials, but it really comes down to the machining and the quality of CNC tools and the attention to detail is what starts to, a little, to bring that money, all right? So on this Colt that you see right here, uh, we do have, again, Ciro fabricated, and that is what you can denote by the keyhole. Now, like I said, there's a couple of others out there, like a square, uh, even a broken or a splintered A is what it's called. And let's go ahead and talk about the square one, because you'll see that Colt will actually utilize multiple different forges for the types of firearms that they have. So let's go ahead and bring one of those out. So Colt also utilizes brass aluminum forging enterprises, denoted by the simple square mark, or the square forge mark that you have on this guy. By the way, just a little funny thing that I noticed on the M16 flat top here, the A4 by Colt, again, using Ciro with the keyhole, but the upper, or excuse me, the <laughs> carry handle, rear sight apparatus and all that here is a brass aluminum forging enterprises. Got the little square mark on there. So, eh, kind of funny. But anyway, what we've got here on the M4 is also a cage code marked M4 and also on the barrel. 13629 is Colt's cage code. That stands simply for commercial and government entity. In other words, at some point in time, Colt has had a a uh, government contract, whether it be with law enforcement, military, and to identify them as such, 13629 is their code. And if you notice on like uh, one of the new PMAGs, even on a Gen 3 PMAG, it has their cage code as well, which is 1LX50. So anytime something is utilized in the government, it's gonna be coded as such. Anyway, Brass Aluminum Forging Enterprise has been around since 1934, and they make all sorts of components for the upper receiver, lower receiver, even 1911 frames. A blank, however. Still no holes drilled or anything like that. It just looks like a metal in the shape of something similar to a gun, uh, whether it be a 1911, whether it be a carry handle upper receiver or a flat top receiver, or just again, just those heavy blanks of 
the lower receiver. And of course, once they, again, once the manufacturer gets a hold of those items is when they start to drill it out and when really the quality starts to come into play. Uh, so anyway, my question is why would a manufacturer utilize materials from two different forges? I would have to say contracts, availability, something along those lines. If you guys have a better answer, let me know down in the comments below, but that's where my head pretty much goes. Anyway, so who else utilizes the square marking brass aluminum forging enterprises? Uh, BCM does as well, and they are definitely known for their quality and excellent firearms and accessories and everything else. And so it's pretty cool to see all these different manufacturers buying from different forges or at least getting their materials. And it also makes you really start to think, wow, the firearms industry really employs a lot of people. So when you've got a lot of politicians out there trying to I don't know, throw these away and prohibit, well, the second amendment ultimately. Think about what that would do to the economy. Anyway, that little rant's over. Uh, so, <laughs> multiple forges providing to multiple firearms uh, manufacturers and even, well, multiple forges providing to one firearms manufacturer. It can happen and ultimately the quality comes down to the machining. Let's talk about another really popular one and that is that splintered A. The last one is that splintered A, which we've got a few rifles that carry that forged mark, and that is Anchor Harvey. He's been around since the early 1920s. Anchor Harvey has actually been involved in motorsports, medical, uh, defense contracts, electric vehicles, automotive. They've, uh, they've done all sorts of stuff, and of course, firearms and heavy equipment. They're just doing forgings for everything out there. And there's a lot of, well, gun manufacturers that utilize Anchor Harvey forging and that would be stag arms Daniel defense iwi springfield and even lmt uses when they're not manufacturing their own uh uses anchor harvey forge so you'll notice too that it's not just the machining at the end of it all too it's the anodizing and the different types of coatings that they might throw on these and you'll notice just some differences in style also but here is the stag arms that's currently part of our build series. This is Matt's gun, of course. Just double checking, it is Matt, you know. But uh, anyway, <laughs> what we've got here again is the Stag 15 and utilizing the Anchor Harvey, again, that splintered A that you see right there on the upper receiver mark. Pretty cool, Daniel Defense, like I said, also utilizing the same one. Now my Mark 18 actually utilizes the Square one, which again was at Brass Aluminum Forging Enterprises. And it also has a 222 stamped on the rear takedown lug, which is kind of interesting. So you'll notice every now and then machining marks on the back of those as well. Not all the time, but sometimes you'll see that. Uh, anyway, and we've got IWI here, of course, as well. Again, you'll see a lot of similarities, but again, also little differences about maybe their charging handles and how they go about applying those. You can see for instance, all of these on this specific one have more angled cuts. Some look less than others right back here where the charging handle meets to the upper receiver. But these angles kind of don't look as sharp as some of the others. Like this one just looks real big on the Daniel. And then again, that just might be the style of charging handle that they're utilizing here. So it might just look, be kind of like an optical illusion pretty much. But anyway, you'll definitely notice differences going from one to the other because they might be using the same forge, but they're not using the same machines to cut and do all of the stuff to turn it into an upper receiver, all right? So just keep that in mind. And we've got the Springfield Saint here as well. So very cool stuff. And again, I just wanted to tap into some of the forging marks because it's just something you don't hear a whole lot about every now and then. Of course, there are a long list of other ones as well. Some that are like super rare and very specific to one year of Colt or something like that. And they're pretty fun to play with and collect if that's your speed. Uh, but at the end of the day, does the forge matter? Put it this way, I don't think it matters as much as the quality and the workmanship that goes behind the machining process and the tooling and the quality control when it comes down to actually making the receiver, whether it be a handgun, a charging handle, an optics tube, an upper receiver or a lower receiver, I want the quality to be where the people are actually making it into a stripped lupper or lower, whatever it is, all right? So 
That's my thoughts on it. You can completely disagree with me down in the comments below, or maybe you want to piggyback off of that and say, yes, I absolutely agree, but here's my comments on this. I don't know. Let me know down in the comments section. And there's one other manufacturer I'd like to display, and that's LWRCI, simply because they're a little unique when it comes to the forging here, because they're using what's called a mono forge design, which isn't completely monolithic like the upper receiver you would find on an LMT, where the rail and the upper receiver are all one piece of metal uh, and not separated, which is very cool. And if you guys have one of those laying around that you'd like to donate to the channel, let me know down in the comments. Anyway, that would be quite the donation too, because those things are like a thousand bucks. But uh, anyway, it's a mono forge design where you can see that the upper receiver on this guy kind of swells up right up here where it makes sense, the most pressure happens, and then it connects to the rail here. So the upper receiver is definitely very different compared to all, every other AR upper receiver that we pretty much know. And so where it swells here and then connects to the rail. Unfortunately, that pretty much means you have to have like their rail to use, but it's quality stuff, so I don't complain too much, all right? Now, the Mono Forge design, like I said, isn't completely monolithic, and you'll notice, too, that they don't have any type of forge markings on the upper receiver. They just have their LWRCI, you know, stamped in right here, and, of course, the model of the gun right up there. Not really else a whole lot to go into as far as the upper receiver and an actual stamping on it. The only thing that I found when kind of taking a look at this guy is nothing on the bottom side, which every now and then you might find like a manufacturer part number, but there is a little M stamped right back here on the rear takedown lug, which is pretty nifty. Again, one of, indicating one of those manufacturers or machining uh, machinists that would actually machine the upper for them. So pretty interesting to find that. Again, you would see that across all different types of rifles. So pretty interesting stuff. But ultimately I wanted to do this video because I feel like on the internet, as we often talk about, you can debate just about anything, especially when it comes to the firearms industry. Don't need to even say, you know, 1911 versus Glock versus 45 versus 9mm versus that versus this versus polymer versus steel, whatever, dude. So a lot of people say, well, this forge is better than that forge and this forge will do more than that forge. And it's kind of like, okay, really what it comes down to is the quality control, the anodizing, the attention to detail, the quality of the machining, of that forged piece of metal. I kind of don't care where it's coming from as long as it's all pretty much 7075 T6, I'm happy with it. Or, you know, 6061 if it works. So, you know, whatever. As long as it's actually quality material, that's what matters. And then, well, whatever the end user does to turn that into a firearm at the end of the day. Let me know again your thoughts down below in the comments section. Head on over to classicfirearms.com to get your entries in on something that is really cool, just like everything else that we've been talking about today. And that is our current giveaway, the HK MR556A1. Talk about forgings. This guy is, well, it's got all sorts of stamps and everything else on it, which is pretty cool and just found by HK. Uh, but <laughs> I'll leave it off there. HK, the MR556A1, short stroke piston driven design, pretty much like the 416, which is an awesome firearm. M-lock rail, big, thick M-lock rail that you can tell through on the BCM angled vertical foregrip because, well, it's just ergonomic and comfortable and everybody's favorite optics duo, the EOTech holographic and the EOTech magnifier. Big fan of that setup. There's not much more really have to do to this guy other than throw in maybe a Lancer mag because that just looks really good with this guy. So there you have it. Head on over to classicfirearms.com to get your entries in for the MR556A1. Utilize the code word PISTON to get yourself a couple hundred extra entries. Don't miss out on that. Guys, as always, we appreciate you and your business. God bless. We'll see you next time at classicfirearms.com.